Thank you so much for this very nice uh, introduction and uh, invitation to be here. Uh, as Sana just mentioned, I am here on behalf of my uh, colleague, David Gregory, who unfortunately couldn't be here. So I hope I will be uh, an acceptable replacement. Um, and although the title uh, for this talk is uh, Endure, uh, the name of an ERC uh, project that David is uh, coordinating, um, I will begin the talk um, <clears throat> uh, with a more broader introduction to the field of uh, in-situ preservation and uh, diving into uh, a more discussion, discussion of uh, the degradation in the marine environment. Uh, so hopefully this will set the scene for a um, presentation on the Endure project, uh, which will be at the end of the presentation. So, Underwater archaeological sites are safeguarded by numerous conventions and treaties in both European and international levels. And uh, these agreements emphasize the uh, importance of prioritizing uh, in-situ protection whenever it's possible. So on a management level, there is a consensus that uh, newly discovered sites should be left undisturbed and preserved uh, in situ for future generations. However, practitioners have said that there is a lack of convincing research to demonstrate that this method is a sustainable management solution. So, those of you who, uh, who have uh, attended this uh, series lecture might um, recognize this slide that I have uh, borrowed with uh, kind permission from Clara Fiedler from the Vikingship Museum in Denmark. Um, who gave a talk on the de development-led archaeology back in November uh, or December. Uh, but the, this illustrates the extensive construction work that is going on uh, on the seabed, in particular in Denmark. And uh, these activities present um, significant op opportunities for uh, discovering new uh, cultural heritage um, artifacts. So with over uh, 3 million shipwrecks worldwide, including uh, an estimate of 20,000 shipwrecks uh, just in Danish waters alone. Uh, the potential for discovery is immense. And uh, additionally, the, the, the rise in the sea level and uh, phenomena like uh, volcanic eruptions have led to uh, submerged uh, cultural heritage landscapes and settlements. So there is a lot of potential for finds. Uh, and this is uh, for in Denmark, for instance, where these, uh, these dots represent um, submerged um, uh, archaeological finds, uh, also settlements, but it could also just be a, a piece of flint. But you can see the shorelines around Denmark just represented by these dots. Um, so the sheer number of finds is essential uh, to be uh, able so due to the, the sheer number of, um, of finds, it's essential to be able to prioritize uh, among sites and artifacts to make a more informed decision about where to focus your preservation efforts effectively. Um, so in order to make this prioritization, uh, information is needed. So archaeologists and conservators and cultural resource managers face questions when considering in situ preservation of archaeological finds. First of all, what is out there and where is it located? So very basic, but yet very essential information. And uh, second, we need to know the state of preservation of the, the material and the, the best strategy um, for preservation. And lastly, uh, a point that is unfortunately often overlooked 
In a management perspective is that the sites need to be monitored if preserved in situ in order to not just get to a point where it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, and because all those sites and materials might be reburied, um, degradation can still be happening. Um, so, some of the major degradation processes that we see uh, to cultural um, heritage artifacts in the marine environment are listed here. Um, as the availability of oxygen is a, a very um, the key factor in the degradation process, it's divided into open water and seabed, although there can be situations where uh, anoxic environments happening in the open water. But otherwise, uh, scour and erosion due to currents and waves actions can provide physical damage uh, to the site or the material itself above the seabed. And uh, biological decay uh, by wood borers um, or bacteria and fungi um, and uh, corrosion of the, the metal itself is also parameters that can thread the material. Uh, however, once buried in the sediment, um, archaeological material can potentially be preserved for millennia uh, when water locking and anoxic conditions, like I said, is optimal. Um, so, and only uh, anaerobic bacteria is uh, degrading. So, all of these uh, different uh, parameters are important when looking into the degradation of archaeological remains. And uh, the reason why we, in some cases, find exceptionally well preserved artifacts like the Vasa ship up there in Sweden or the green leaves that you see on the right. Uh, which are more than 3,000 uh, 3, years old. Um, and in other cases, you're just left with rocks or uh, weakening wooden plank planks. So, um, in order to try and model this rate of decay, um, you need to calculate uh, the slope of this um, line. Um, but it's really complex and it's not just one thing, it's a series of different things happening. And I have listed some of the, the, the natural processes that we see in these um, um, that are determining the, the rate of decay. Um, we see that uh, yeah, waves, like I've already mentioned, salinity, uh, the sediment type of the seabed, uh, are all things that uh, needs to be considered when uh, determining uh, the rate of decay. Um, and then there's also the more human impacts uh, as uh, salvage or um, direct um, effects of fishing, where trawling or fishing gear can get stuck in the in the uh, heritage that's not yet uh, uh, So a few examples of these, uh, this complexity of uh, different things that are determining the rate of decay is, uh, for example, um, this um, reconstruction of a shipwreck that was uh, made and then sunk um, as part of a Kas Marine archaeological archaeological park in Turkey. So it was sunk in uh, 2007. And after a year and a half, the wooden structures was attacked, had been attacked by shipworm, weakened it, and uh, just uh, a few winter storms, and then the, the severe damage happening to the hull. Uh, and after uh, three years, there was only part of the mast and keel uh, remained. The rest had been destroyed by shipworm. So, in the end, a numerous of different uh, environmental parameters and events ended up in a very unfavorable environment for the preservation of this wreck. Um, another example is uh, of this complexity in the determining degradation rate could be um, this Neolithic fish wire from the uh, just off the, the island of um, Nexo in Denmark, um, where um, environmental parameters in the water changed uh, so that the seagrass disappeared. And uh, with the seagrass disappearing, the sediment eroded away so that the, the Gucci layer, where all the finds are lying, um, was um, 
exposed and uh, degraded. Uh, got attacked by uh, oh, that was too <laughs> um, by um, by mussels, uh, which were not only digging into the material itself but also in the whole layer of the of the gutia. So quite interestingly, uh, what we see is that there is a there is a um, a correlation between uh, where you see seagrass and where you find uh, the best preserved archaeological sites. Uh, so uh, along the shorelines, you can see here, and which is simply because that the, the root system stabilizes and prevent uh, erosion of the seabed. But you also see that in many cases, the, the, the actual plant itself catches um, sediment in the water and slows the current. So diving into uh, the Endura project, um, it has been going on for the past year and a half and will proceed until uh, the end of uh, 27 uh, with the title Sustainable Preservation of Underwater, Cultural, uh, underwater Archaeological Sites and All Approach to Cultural Heritage Management. Um, and uh, so yeah, the, the essential idea of this project, project is to try and detect change, which you can, which is represented by this figure in the middle. Uh, the wrestler where you can see this one was um, uh, half buried in the sediment and this half had been exposed to the open water. So quite a difference in the preservation. Um, and the project contains four uh, work packages where uh, work package one is uh, based on visual assessment of uh, degradation of shipwrecks, um, where using uh, multi-beam um, uh, images and high resolution imagings uh, and um, um, understanding the environment uh, from these uh, images uh, and using a database of around uh, seven, uh, 600 uh, shipwrecks in the, the North Sea and in the Baltic Sea, uh, where all of these different, all of these wrecks had both multi-beam and high resolution imaging. So based on this, it was possible to do this um, classification of the, um, uh, of the state of preservation based on this visual um, assessment. <clears throat> where you can see that um, shipwrecks in class one uh, was complete. Uh, in class two, they were coherent but incomplete. Uh, in class three, they were scattered but still in an order, where in class four, they were scattered and disordered. So just based on, on this uh, categorization system, um, it was possible to make this map. Um, um, where each uh, rec uh, is uh, color coded according to this classification system. Um, so then uh, all of this data was combined with the open source uh, environmental data uh, from these different areas. So all of these different parameters was fed into this uh, GIS model and Using this, it was possible to, um, you can see here the different maps based on these different environments, environmental data. Um, they were incorporated and uh, in the end, it was possible to make a map, well, too much, um, <clears throat> uh, where you can see the preservation potential um, where I, uh, um, uh, just based on these uh, geographical uh, locations where there is a, um, a lower uh, preservation potential out here in the North Sea compared to what you see in the Baltic. Um, uh, however, all of this data that was fed into this model is still very broad ranged, um, and uh, which means that local conditions on a specific site can vary somewhat closely um, to a late to Otherwise, there is a, uh, there can be a, another site close to that can have different parameters, and that doesn't show up from this. So, uh, for example, you can see here there's a uh, there's a ship lying in a 
in what is a, a very a very nicely preserved wreck, but because it's lying so deep in, in an anoxic environment, um, the the um, these are the the, the metal uh, 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 iron nails. Sorry, um, they have started to corrode, and therefore the planking of the ship has started to come apart. Um, and you can actually see that from the, the back up here, uh, that it's uh, that all the planks have uh, have fallen off. Um, yeah, so there can be local. Uh, local environments infecting something that on a broader scale would be looking like it's very well preserved. So um, this is uh, digging into uh, work package two, where we are focusing on a more detailed uh, into this, uh, these specific sites. So here we are looking at both at the archaeological material, but also at the environment of the site. And so on these specific sites and not just on a broad scale, um, and doing uh, decay experiments in the lab, where we are either using uh, modern material or archaeological material and, and feeding in different environmental parameters so we can control the systems. Um, and by this, we can start modeling rates uh, of chemical and microbial decay. Um, <clears throat> we are also going to use uh, genetics genetic tools to try and identify uh, some of the bacteria uh, associated with the degradation of wooden structures, but also on the corrosions of uh, metals. Um, and with this knowledge, uh, we are, uh, by knowing these different uh, microbes, um, we can start looking into their metabolism and see what kind of um, um, degradation they are actually uh, uh, that are actually happening in these uh, materials. Uh, so, taking on or uh, moving on to the to work package three, where we are then going to take all of the data that we have from the the first work package with the the more broader range, looking into the the more fine details of the the de decay of the material, and try to model this um, um, decay rate. And in the end, um, we are hoping to get some, or we are looking into a more sustainable methods for uh, protecting sites in situ. So, in a previous um, project that we worked on, we used, um, uh, we looked at these, uh, that I talked about the seagrass before, uh, and uh, we have tried to implement artificial seagrass mats, mats onto archaeological sites to see if they can do the trick that natural seagrass is doing. However, now uh, we are trying to do it in a more sustainable way, uh, trying to plant out uh, seagrass uh, in these areas so they can um, uh, hold on to the, the sediment on top of the, the sites. Uh, and then try and optimize these different methods so we don't have to go out and plant every single little plant, but maybe do something like this, but with, um, but with real plants. Um, and then, uh, in the end, I'm just going to mention a little, like, uh, because we can't, we need to have some kind of uh, prioritization in uh, what we preserve. We can't preserve everything. Um, and therefore, uh, uh, the trying to accept that something uh, will degrade and and hopefully all of this knowledge that we will be gaining from this project can feed into uh, a more decisions on how to prioritize. So just to uh, sum up the whole project that uh, we are looking into all these different environmental variables how the the human impact um, the impacts uh, also on the sites uh, using remote sensing um, and computer link to model the the decay rates and all of this knowledge can hopefully do the trick in prioritizing sites in uh, what we will preserve and whatnot so Thank you.
Uh, I will be talking about the submerged legacies and connecting the culture with a natural and common narrative of maritime heritage preservation. So I was born in Thebes and growing up, I was a very young age exposed to the culture of ancient Greece. Of course, as you know, um, Hercules was a local hero in Thebes, so I was, that was the easy thing to happen. And, uh, but I, it, it, I had to come uh, to a um, uh, later age that I actually um, go to, sorry. Bit stressed. So it, it, uh, only after a later age did I understand a better and uh, got a better understanding of how the culture of, of, of ancient Greece uh, was uh, so uh, plural, pluralistic and actually embedding all the natural environment into its uh, legends, into the stories that were told. And this was something that made uh, something very important, made big uh, influence to, in, in me. And uh, I was I was coming to as I was coming to this place to have this talk. I, I was walking around Acropolis, and of course, when I do this many times, my mind goes back to time, and it's so often it's so easy. If, if I close my eyes, or I, my imagination takes me back to the classic ages. But it's not just the monuments that uh, have this effect. Uh, the standing monuments we have now. Uh, around us in Greece, it's also the landscapes. For example, when you go and sit at the end, at the edge of the rocks in Sunium and you see towards the sea, it's the exact same view uh, King Aegeus had when he was watching the ships coming from Crete, waiting for his son to come, to come from Crete. And it's, uh, it's the exact same view. And this something makes, if you think about it, it's something that we can relate to and understand better uh, the way they felt, those people who lived in this land so many years ago. But then, and then you go and stand and you visit Heronia and you see this statue of a lion uh, where it was found on top of a, of, um, a mass burial site of 254. Um, warriors uh, from the band, the sacred band of Thebes that had uh, fought bravely, brave, bravely like lions, the, the troops of uh, Philip II of Macedon. And uh, this was uh, raised to commemorate their, their bravery. And there's a disconnect because, you know, lions, we don't have lions in Greece. We haven't had lions for the last 2000 years. And it's something that does not resonate to us, to modern Greeks. However, lions used to live, as we, as we have uh, um, recently discovered, lions used to live in ancient Greece. And uh, the people who raised this statue, lions meant something to them. They had an idea of their fight, how, their, how ferocious they were. And so we feeling there's a disconnect because we don't have the same feeling as they did. And this is the same, uh, large animals, large predators like lions have been uh, eliminated from land from, since many years ago. Uh, it's not just the case of lions, many other predators have been, uh, had the same fate. But I claim that in our seas, our seas are still the last wilderness we have here in Greece and also around the world. It's the last wild places. And it's very easy to show you that. So if uh, all, the, all those people who are diving among you can go tomorrow and have a dive near Sunyan. And there you will be able to swim next to one of the largest predators we have in the, in the world, the bluefin tuna, which is the equivalent of lions in the sea. And as you do that, you can, uh, and learning that the ancient Greeks used to be able to catch fish like this, catch uh, tunas, and they, they used the, uh, the traps, and there were traps set up in the same surrounding gulf we're talking about, up, up, across the other, the other coastline near Methana. And there's this, this animal that joins us today in that, part, that, uh, that uh, era, through its migration in the Mediterranean waters, which has been continuous over the millennia, 
it's it's actually like a transport to that area for us for us as well. We can feel the awe the, those people would have left felt when they saw these animals when they hunted down these animals. And we don't have to be a diver to witness marine life the way the ancients did. If we go, well, we have the dolphins, of course. Uh, these are the common dolphins, Delphinus delphis, which are particularly not so common these years in Greece, but they used to be more common in the ancient times. And what's more particular about this, this is the fresco from the Knossos uh, Palace, let me know, Knossos Palace. And these are common dolphins which are not, which are pelagic. They don't come close to the shore. So in order to see them, you have to go in a boat and go out in the open sea. It's a testament about how, uh, what a naval nation the Minoans were at the time. And of course, we have the amphoras and we have the patterns on them like the, the, the famous Minoan uh, octopus which, to my opinion, is not the common octopus we usually associate it with because it has long branches, long uh, tentacles and one series of, uh, uh, of... I don't remember the word in Greek, in English. Vetuses, anyone in the audience? Section, yeah, in case, sections. And uh, I'm going to show you a video of that animal. This is the Callistotopus macropus. It's a totally nocturnal species. I have never witnessed this animal going around during daytime. And it has these long arms and one series of, of suckles, is the word. And uh, it's a wonder how these people back in the Bronze Age had seen, had more knowledge about marine life. We're talking about a nocturnal octopus and a pelagic dolphin. Had more knowledge about the marine life than modern Greeks have. And if we go closer and look at the delicate patterns in this, in this, in this specific amphora, we see some other patterns like, uh, that resemble maybe algae or corals. And here's where the um, the myth of the creation of corals comes into place. We have uh, Theseus cutting the head of Medusa. And by cutting the head of Medusa, the, the, the myth says that the blood dropped into the sea and uh, petrified the, the, the algae and made them corals. And uh, so this was known in antiquity. And it's, there's a very interesting story, details about the story of Medusa and how close this tale is to the actual biological, biological cycle of the corals and the, and the Nigerians. But I, want to, I won't go into much detail about this right now. But in any case, a red coral was known from the antiquities and was being fished, was being harvested in the antiquities. And we used to have, have it probably in very shallow waters so that people in ancient times would go skin diving and, and capture it. And uh, It took me about 20 years to be able to find red coral in Greece, to be able to see it with my own eyes in its environment. It's very deep now. It's not, you can't find it in the shallow waters where normally we, we can dive. And this is because of the overexploitation of this species that has occurred over the ages, over the millennia. Uh, but this is also something that Greeks are known for, uh, diving and harvesting the sea. And this is part of the culture. Uh, we all know about the sponge divers who used to go from uh, sponge divers from the Decanese, from Simi, from uh, from Kalimnos, but as well as places like Trichia in Magnesia, in Volos. And they used to go and take uh, not only sponges, but also corals and other species. And uh, from these tales of people doing this in those previous centuries, we have uh, Andreas Kakavitsas, a novelist, wrote in the novel Logia Exploris, a marine novel in 1899, talking about a specific, uh, a specific encounter with uh, a black coral, the usury. The usury. And uh, this is not, a, this is actually, a, we call it a, in marine biology, this is a golden coral, but we call it because 
the skeleton is black, but the other layer is, uh, is yellow. And in the tail, there is this tail of a big, huge coral tree that's really thick in, in a, the trunk is really thick. And people have tried to cut it down, but the, the, the coral fought back and they killed it, those people who tried to cut it down. So when, when someone went to see it, you would see skeletons hanging from its branches. And indeed, if you go to where the novel talks about, just outside Volos, in this strait between uh, Pilion and Evia, and you have the proper equipment and proper training, and you go diving at around 50 meters depth, you will indeed see corals like this. This is the golden coral. This is up more than two meters high and two meters wide. And if you go a little bit around the corner, a little bit deeper, 10 meters deeper, at 60 meters, you also find some other magnificent animals. This is the true black coral. It, it's also, uh, it has a white color of the, the surface is white, but the, the, underneath it, the skeleton is black. And what is remarkable about these animals is that they are some of the most long-lived species on this planet. There's a survey, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a study that has collected live specimens of these animals and did carbon-24 dating and found that these animals were living for more than 2,500 years. So imagine on a on a day of uh, summer, a specific day of summer, you're diving at this strait between the Straits of Avia and Parastikos Gulf, and you're 55 meters depth. And you have this, you have this magnificent uh, equipment on you, and you press the button, and you're traveling back in time, 2,500 years back. And you're standing there, you can still see the corals. They're, they're smaller, but they're still there. The same corals you, you were seeing before. And you raise your head towards the surface, and what you see are two rings charging into each other. Because we are at the same spot where the naval battle of Artemisio took place 2,500 2, years back. And these corals were probably there alive, witnessing it. And, uh, but we don't, don't pay the same respect to those uh, individuals, those markers of those events. You see them now, they're covered in uh, nets and lines, fishing lines, and they're threatened, their survival is threatened, although they are directly, they were there 2,500 years ago. We don't have the same respect as we did for uh, monuments like the Lion of Heronia. And as we, uh, what I have to say is that um, as we're closing in and we're in the age of the sex extinction, uh, we're losing so many species at a so fast rate. And it's not just, it's not all the other, we know about all the ecosystem services that this biodiversity is giving to us. But we have to understand, we have to remember that losing our biodiversity is also losing the links with her past because our tales are connected with the nature we have been living with and actually actually this presentation is an extent to archaeologists to actually work together and work towards conservation in both the marine the marine life and their archaeological finds so i would continue to show you some uh, some case studies that deal with uh, another very common species we have in the Mediterranean, the Posidonia Oceania Sigres, are dealing with co-management of natural and cultural resources. So Posidonia Oceanica is one of the most uh, rheumatic species in, uh, in the Mediterranean. It's an EU priority habitat type. It has those so many ecosystem services it provides, and it's very common at depths between 1 and 45 meters. These are the depths we usually work with underwater archaeology excavations, and this is where we find most of the findings in the, in the Mediterranean. And its, it's significance is that equivalent to the, the, of the tropic for, uh, tropical forests. 
and I will show you some photos of what seagrasses look like. This is a big extent of uh, seagrass in Methana, in Methoni, sorry. And this is all the, the root systems. You can see the, the, the fruit because it's plants and the, the biodiversity that it attracts and it's home to. And I will show you now a, a, an example of mismanagement. So we are here now, travel back to Sunion, and you see the archaeological site is here with the Temple of Poseidon. And underneath here, we have all, this is the Bay of Sunion with so many boats anchored here. And uh, it is reasonable, this is a sh shallow deck between zero and 20 meters, we expect to have seagrasses there. This is the most thing, this is the most probable thing to have. And uh, so this year, this uh, September, our team teamed up with WWF and we together with the Blue Panda uh, boat, we did a survey at this specific site to see the, 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 the state of the environment underneath the Sunya temple. And what we found was really, really disheartening. You can see so many tracks of uh, anchoring and the seagrass has recessed so much, we're talking about at least 50 or 60% of the seagrass area has been lost. And this is a conundrum, we're talking about, we have the Poseidon Temple, perfectly restored and very carefully uh, looked after, whereas Poseidon seagrass underneath it is at this stage. And uh, this is something we, we, this is a missed opportunity for co-management of this area, of course, and the same legacy. And second, I, was, I would like to present you another uh, example of co-management. This time we'll be talking about an excavation that uh, takes place in Kithira, the Mentor Super Excavation Project. It's a project of the effort of underwater archaeology. And the director is Dr. Denis Kumais, who is here at the audience as well. So uh, this is the uh, the ship. The mentor was the brig that was uh, commissioned by Lord Elgin to take the marble from Parthenon to London. And on the way to London in 1802, it sank uh, outside uh, Kithira Island in Avlemonas, with the whole uh, with everything that was carrying it. The marbles were retracted one or two years later by diving and this excavation is focusing on the ship itself and has been going on since 2011. So in this case we looked at, uh, it lies at 20 meters depth and of course we have seagrasses there as well. So in this case we try to see uh, the state of the environment where this shipwreck lies, the state of preservation of the seagrasses, and to have an idea of how much damage the shipwreck has caused to the, to the natural environment, how much damage the natural environment has caused to the shipwreck, and what can be done to mitigate uh, the, the, um, the negative effects of the excavation to the natural environment. So it had sunk on top of a seagrass, and then uh, it killed all, all, all the part where it was lying underneath was killed, was uh, destroyed, of course, because no photosynthesis could occur. But the rest of the seagrass has been, uh, st has been remained stable since, uh, uh, since 2019 when we started this study. And we tried to look into what kind of uh, pressures the excavation might have on the seagrass bed. So we have the sediments that fall through the sieve of the airlift collection basket, and this creates a plume that, uh, um, that does not leave the sunlight to actually enter and help photosynthesize, and that also there's a burial perhaps uh, going on on the seagrass. You see there are suspension of light sediments at the excavation site. These are potential pressures we have identified. And of course, this is, the this is a photo of the shipwreck exposed. You can see that uh, the previous efforts when the excavation started did not actually look into mitigating those pressures and uh, was actually neglecting the seagrass, the natural environment. 
So there was some um, direct mechanical disturbance. But uh, to my to my no, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time that archaeologists and marine biologists sit down and look for a plan of mitigation of how to conduct better and more environmental friendly excavations. So we propose a few mitigation measures like to move away the anchoring from Posidonia Meadows and clear to select clear patches to place objects and debris and perhaps to uh, install an extra season on an early basket to collect thinner sediments. And of course, we, uh, we, we thought that uh, if the excavation wanted to go on outside the barriers of the ship, looking into other artifacts, if Posidonia Sidras was to be actually uh, destroyed, then uh, mitigation like transplantation should be considered as a, as a mitigation measure. So I hope I have not we're extending my time, and I would like to close with, uh, as a conservationist, with a list of the words of Zakev Cousteau. That in full truth, we are partners to the fish, the crab, the snail, the grasses that grow in secret places beyond our sight. Upon our lives, our lives depend. Upon their survival, hangs our own. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, one of the things that strikes me about both your talks is we're, it's, it's the marine environment is the primary thing that we're talking about tonight, which is nice to discuss because it seems to get left out a lot of times when we talk about maritime archaeology. And even though we have this, we call it in Denmark marine archaeology, so it's the environment actually we're referring to uh, marine archaeology. Um, and here in Greece, sometimes it's, we've talked about it in the first uh, lecture we had where it's, it's underwater archaeology, you can translate it as, um, it's about the environment as well, where this takes place. Um, so we have this interconnectedness between biocultural heritage tonight as a theme, which is really nice to, to bring up because it's been maybe so technical on, on sites and what the, the culture, the built cultural, the tangible cultural heritage is that we work with as, as archaeologists. Um, but also it's a question of where does the environment end and the culture begin? Or where does the culture end and the environment begin? Because this is what's happening in both the cases that you're talking about. Um, and so it's, it's, we have this Mediterranean, maybe a very caustic environment, very harsh environment to some of the built culture that we have. Maybe it's a little bit less so in, in the North Sea or the Baltic. Um, but it's, it's also coming down to, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about where this, where this ends with, uh, in terms of your research, uh, where, do you, where do you draw the line in terms of what is the environment and how do you react to the environment, but how does this affect, for example, um, the protocols you work with in your management? Protocols. You, for example, talked about working the mentor site with marine biologists and archaeologists working together. Is that transferring to a wider protocol standard that you'd like to see implemented at sites underwater in Greece? That's a, a question maybe for you and also for Anne Marie. Where do you see this impacting maybe the, the data that you're collecting from different sites? Uh, how that could impact data that's collected from sites? on the environment and cultural heritage in Denmark. That's something you could address in, a, in general. Your, your wishes, I know you can't speak for, for the broader um, system, but what, what you're seeing from your experiences. So maybe, Yannis, I'll ask you first. I'll give it to you first. Well, as you saw, Mentor acts like a very good example of many of the excavations happening in Greece and around, around, around the Mediterranean because it's an accessible depth, 20 meter depth. So it's something that uh, archaeologists can work easily at. And um, it's, a bit, that it's a bit steps that we have the possibility of Oceanic, which is rarely happening for the European Union. And so far, we have not, I've never heard of any other example in the, in the Mediterranean trying to mitigate the, uh, the effects of the actual work done on excavations. And we're looking forward to putting those, those ideas we have from our, the, the case of the, of the Super Mentor into some guidelines, how to implement them in other sites like this. Uh, so far, unfortunately, the marine environment, the, 
the, the, the ecosystems have not had the attention so far from the part of archaeologists working on them. And uh, when somebody finds an, an artifact, all they need, all they, they think about is just collecting the artifact and not the damage that might uh, occur to the natural environment. So it's a thing that's, I think it's changing. And this is the first step towards new guidelines and new procedures on how to do this. And we're, we're actually in a state where we're losing our natural habitats and the EU is calling for restoration projects anyway. So if we're, we're, as we're going to the, rest of the decade of restoration, we have to look into this as well. We're getting there. Yeah, yeah so um, you asked whether or how the, uh, the environment uh, where it starts and where the archaeology begins. Um, so, I mean, um, uh, for example, in terms of in situ preservation, uh, knowing the environment is extremely uh, important, mm -hmm. especially um, to choose whether this specific site is um, is good for or can be used for um, for reburial. Um, at the moment, um, the cultural uh, heritage agency in Denmark has appointed uh, maybe seven new areas around Denmark where it's um, protected for in situ preservation. So um, the idea with this is that uh, that you can rebury uh, artifacts at these specific sites, and then they are naturally protected by law. Um, however, um, it's really important when you choose these different sites, uh, areas, that you have looked into all of the different aspects um, of the environment within these sites um, in order to make the, the right decision of whether they can be used for such a perspective. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I just have a follow up too, because obviously the, the elephant in the room is, is climate change. What's happening with especially Posidonia, it's so sensitive and we're having, we're having these blooms where the water, sea level, our seawater temperatures, even at 10, 20 meters depth, is we're seeing temperatures that we've never seen before. This is going to impact sites and it's also going to happen in the North Sea and the Baltic. So this continued process, it's not just a static, what are we doing right now, but you're making also I assume predictions for what will happen in the future. Yeah, that exact uh, point was uh, one of the things that they um, they looked into in the, the Rec Protect project, um, looking into um, climate change and how the rising temperature and salinity changes uh, in the Baltic uh, could, whether you can see more shipworm, uh, yeah. shipworm, a muscle degrading archaeological water of wood a big issue um, so but you can see that they, they get there's getting more storms coming in that way pushing more um, um, more water in uh, also the other way around so the whole environment is changing and and you suddenly see that these um, um, organisms are living further in uh, the Baltic and potentially degrading um, Rigs that have been protected for millennia. Yeah. If you want to add yeah. As far as the Mediterranean is concerned with climate change, yes, it's something we will. We there are projections about how the species will uh, or not get extinct after the rise of temperature. And Poseidonia is very sensitive indeed. And there are projections that yes, if we have a few degrees more of uh, seawater temperature, we will lose it. And uh, we have seen impacts on corals so far because these are the organisms that stay below the, the, um, the thermocline. And now the thermocline is going deeper, so we have, they're getting exposed to higher temperatures. We have mass mortalities of corals all along the Mediterranean basin. Uh, but I think, unfortunately, I have to say this, I don't like the, I don't like the idea, but if we do lose Postonia, Going to find more artifacts <laughs> yeah. because it is the case that the sea grasses have covered a lot of artifacts and maybe uh, shipwrecks. So it's a booming industry for the archaeologists in the future. 
Not so good for carbon. <laughs> yeah, not so good for carbon. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. So, Williams, please share your thoughts with us. Or, or not. <laughs> <laughs> But I think if, if I can make a comment, um, you know, we say that protecting the natural environment equals protecting the underwater cultural heritage. Or, or are those two things that will go like, sort of parallel, or they can one will equal the other? I don't know if I make sense. I hope I. Can I, yes. yeah. I think uh, I think it's more complex than that. Um, but um, for example, with the seagrass, we have a huge problem in Denmark with emission from the the, um, the farmers uh, that have uh, led to uh, the lower oxygen levels in the in the, in the oceans, and the, therefore a lot of the seagrass are dying simply. And um, if you remember from my talk, I talked about how seagrass is yeah, uh, preventing erosion, all these different things. It, it's really yeah, good for preservation. And suddenly you have a, a, a situation where you're losing these things due to human impact. Um, but low oxygen level is also good for archaeological uh, preservation. So suddenly you have, yeah. It's complex because you're losing the seagrass, but you also want the low oxygen. <laughs> so you can't really work together those two things. But yeah, I would also like to add something that perhaps depends on the pressure we're talking about. If, for example, if you close a region, if you if you protect a specific area underwater from all extractive activities, for example, trawling, then you have the benefit of protecting both the seabed with the natural natural resources the seabed as well as the artifacts there. So it depends on what kind of pressure you're looking into and what kind of protection you're talking about. Uh, preserving the natural environment, its natural state generally should be protective of the artifacts as well, generally. And I would like, um, unless we have another question, I had to add, add, add something else that I didn't saw in the presentation about the missed chances in the swimming, for example. We have a case in Greece where we have a strong uh, the, 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 the laws regarding antiquities are stronger than the environmental laws, at least in their uh, enforcement. And this is an interesting case to look into management of uh, natural resources using the uh, laws for antiquities. For example, if in the case of Sunium, uh, the people who did the delineation of the areas, about the management of the area, had included the bay and had banned uh, dropping anchor there, we would still have the, uh, the Posidonian type there. And there are other cases where usually the, the delineation of the areas where the, the, um, the archaeological site is uh, when it is established, the, the, the limits do not take into account the physical characteristics of the area usually. They're most basically around the area of the shipwreck of an, of an, of an, of an, of an artifact or something like this, never to include the actual physiogeographical re region. In the, the, so this is an opportunity in new designations or altering des or, uh, designations of uh, underwater sites to include more of natural environment in a way that makes sense for the natural environment as well. This is what I need to mean about co-management. Yes, please. Okay, hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Alex Tutas, I'm going to be an archaeologist myself. And I have a thought of a question, at least I have thought of a comment. So, yeah, I'll share this with you. Uh, I think that both presentations show how interdisciplinary approaches can actually help research itself. I mean, it's very good for management, but um, I have found out that having a uh, marine biologist at my side when I dig a site is better for my understanding of the site because I have a better understanding of the site formation process. And as we all know, 
archaeology is about making this special connections. And it's very different uh, for my interpretation to know that this name has land here because something made it land there. Because uh, the, the environment actually interacts with the cultural heritage. And I, I would, uh, because I'm, I'm part of the mentorship project as well, I have worked with uh, Janis, and we have discussed this at length. I urge other maritime archaeologists to have this kind of collaborations with scientists from this, with different disciplines. Because not only they provide us with valuable data, but it opens our minds as well to our own archaeological interpretations. Thanks. Now that the dialogue has opened with Alexis, uh, there's a chance for us as well to learn from uh, the, the works of archaeology. And we have this issue of shifting baselines. And because we're now looking, we are asked to preserve and actually to bring back nature at its previous state. And uh, in the Mediterranean, especially in Greece, we did have marine research, biologists going into water and doing this kind of work uh, until very recently. So we don't have a baseline of what the environment used to be like 60 or 70 years ago. And we now see that we can go back in archives because underwater archaeology was happening before marine, marine biology was being um, was actually um, taking place in these waters. We can find previous archives, photos from uh, previous excavations, or like the, 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 the like Fort Morton or Cousteau, or after these people who actually went and took photos and have we can we can, can go and visit those photos and have an idea of what this environment looked like 60, 70 years ago. And there are many, there are many actual, um, there's, not, there's another, there's another um, example that I didn't put in the presentation, but how much information we biologists can take from artifacts. There was this play, and we have this one, this play the story. Yes. So there, there was this plane, the Second World War plane that sank uh, during the Second World War near Naxos Island. And ten years ago, a, a trawler brought it up. Brought it up. And uh, it, it laid at about, I think, 200 or 300 meters depth, inaccessible to studies for, uh, for diving or anything else. And it was covered in corals, in deep corals. And at this exact moment, we have an exact, we have, we have an, uh, a way to actually go and estimate the rate of growth of those corals because we knew the exact, exact date of that uh, plane sinking. It would be uh, very difficult to have another way. So there are many examples where we can take information from your work as well. And it's a very, very valuable collaboration. I think we have a question, yeah. Yes, uh, concerning uh, the, 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 the problem and the issue whether the barriers still existed in Greece uh, in the fourth century BC, I wish to say that uh, probably the barriers existed in part of Greece uh, because we, we have a passage of our cell phone to refer to barriers still in the valley of the Stribo river. Uh, but, uh, in my brain, there is no uh, one single passage uh, which uh, uh, concerns uh, the, time, the presence of lions uh, in southern Greece uh, in the 4th century BC. Uh, I wish to have your opinion about it. Thank you. Actually, I'm a new biologist, so no expert in lions. Uh, but before this presentation, I went and looked about the findings and uh, there have been findings of bones of lions all over Greece, as well as south in the South Greece, but not as I think it was much back. In, I think up around 1,000 BC, and around 1,000 BC, they estimate that lions left. The, there were no more lions in Peloponnese, for example. But I'm, I'm not an expert, though. So this is all I've read. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Any other questions, comments, ideas? Uh, probably not. I mean, we can, we can, oh, yes, please, please, please. Hi, um, I was wondering when uh, you talk about the anaerobic bacteria uh, and how they attack, the, having this biological attack on the artifacts, uh, could they also have, for example, beneficial like effects of this bacteria on artifacts, like I don't know, like the crust, if they form any like things that would actually protect the artifacts. Yeah. So whether the anaxic bacterial degradation is actually good, or whether they have other metabolic, or they can do other stuff, is that your question? Yeah. yeah. Not to my knowledge, <laughs> uh, then they're just degraders. Um, uh, yeah, degrading the, the cellulose in the cells of the food. So I haven't, I haven't heard of them being good for the, the archaeology. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, I think we can close now. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.